Hello and welcome to Chasing Creativity. I'm Kiran Mandral. I'm a writer and an author. And in this series of podcasts, we're going to take a deep dive into creativity. Today, I have with me Madhuri Banerjee, who is a dear friend first, a very, very dear friend indeed. Always, yes. And she's got a very impressive resume, which I'm going to read out right now. She is the author of ten books. She was a columnist with Maxim. Asian Age, Cosmo has her own blog on CNN and IBN, editor with Star Bharat, and did 300 episodes of Southern India. So going right into it, Madhuri, from documentary to writing to television to now real estate, you have been constantly reinventing yourself. Why does this happen? How does this happen? I think reinvention is the name of the game, actually. Because the world is changing, and if we don't become newer and better versions of ourselves, then you know the youngsters will just take over and have more to do. So I just feel that one should not limit themselves, and um, that's what I want to do. Like I think my soul desires more and more in this world and this life, and I try and give my soul what it needs. <laughs> <laughs> and right now from all the creative work you've done in the past you've gone into real estate madhuri that's really fascinating tell us a bit about this you know i feel that the more we put pressure on our creativity the less creative we are okay so when we feel that okay let's do something which is non creative which is the opposite of what you think can be creative is when creativity can come and you know there are a lot of people who have said that you know in this meditation state when you're not thinking of your novel or your ideas or your work or solutions is when the answers come so i feel that i wanted to get into real estate because i've always been you know shifting houses and buying a house and selling a house and doing all of that and i'm now wanting to help other people buy and sell their dream homes so that's where i've got into it i'm a rera agent with goa and i help people buy and sell property and buy their houses because i think it's a booming market and while i'm doing this i'm coming up with so many different ideas to write and i'm meeting so many different people who are not in the creative field but such interesting characters so all of that goes into creativity as well right so if you can do other things besides this one creative thing that you are so focused on i think you'll find creativity in that that's lovely in fact i think many authors have done really really boring day jobs i know that pg woodhouse worked in a bank and uh, i think a lot of them work in lot, banks a lot of them worked in banks banks I, have a lot to answer for i think like i you know when i tell people that okay you're a doctor or you are a, a lawyer i think you should write i don't think I, the writers now should take a break and do something else because we are limited with our imagination our society our you know the communities that we live in so only if you expand your community or job or the people that you meet can you come up with something interesting to write so i encourage everybody to write and read a lot before they write that is a very important point yeah, isn't course, it yeah. because we have many people who just want to get into the writing without doing the riyas of the reading yeah it's most important if you want to write you must read the genre that you want to write in all across genres across genres you know being yeah. fussy about it yeah but read a lot <laughs> read a lot absolutely and read our books but that's another thing altogether yes, yes. please read <laughs> our books first <laughs> talking about our books congratulations madhuri on life switch thank you so much your latest book and it's a very fascinating premise about two women yes as the title says switching their lives how did this idea come to you I was sitting in a resort one day and I picked up somebody else's phone and walked out you know because all phones look alike nowadays and then I realized that our lives are on our phones right so if we switched our phones would we switch our lives and that's where the idea came about and I said that okay how do two people actually switch their lives from there the idea came that let's have two women who look alike who can switch lives because I've also read that there are seven people in this world who look like you you know and you know when you see on instagram that oh like you know these two celebrities look alike and things like that i was like what if they're ordinary people who look like each other 
So I took this housewife and this corporate advertising woman and I made them switch lives to see how they can, you know, fit into each other's shoes. And it's the story of how they find themselves and how they find love in their life. You've always written very different stories, Madhuri. And stories which were, which could be considered scandalous, so to say. But were much ahead of their times because you wrote about the Indian woman and you didn't really shy away about writing about erotica. erotica and the fact that they're not really happy. I mean, that's a big thing that, you you know, we need to accept and acknowledge and realize that everyone is struggling in their own ways, even if they feel they look happy in their little cocoon lives. So I think most of your books have been quite uh, different and ahead of their times. Thank you for saying so. I mean, I feel that my first book, Losing My Virginity and Other Dumb Ideas, I wrote it and included the word virginity on the cover simply because in 2009, we weren't really talking about gender issues, empowerment of women, you know, and sexuality at all. And uh, they weren't that many chicklets that had come out at that point of time discussing, you know, sexuality. And it wasn't just like an erotica that at that point I was labeled with. It was about a woman taking her own sexuality and her own choices in her life. And I think all of us do that in our life, but we never talk about it. Because I think as the years have gone by, society has become a little more conservative, if I may say so. And uh, we feel that the more we talk about it, the more we are labeled. So we don't talk about it, but it is there. And, you know, even with my book, Scandalous Housewives, it was about women who have been repressed and they take their own life into their hands. And that's important. So that's what I want to write about. And if it's ahead of its time, it's not a great thing because why people don't you, buy it. Why would <laughs> because you say people, it's not a great thing? Because there aren't that many sales of the book because it's too ahead of its time <laughs> and I'd rather have like some, you know, revenue coming in from the sales of a book rather than it being so modern that when I'm 80, people get it. <laughs> I'm sure they'll pick it up because, I mean, we all need to learn how to take charge of our own sexuality and things like that. And high time, I mean... We have consent and sexuality educators everywhere on the on YouTube and everything. So read about it in fiction. Why not? I think it's difficult for people to pick up a book and read about women making empowering choices mm-hmm. because women feel themselves that there aren't that many choices for them in their own limited life. So it becomes difficult to then say, but I'm not like that. So therefore, they immediately dismiss that character. And instead of seeing it maybe as a fantasy and oh. picking it up. So, you know, maybe seeing it as a choice that they can have later in life as well. But most people dismiss it, saying that empowerment is not something we have. So does that worry you, this attitude of people to dismiss it? to think that they don't want to identify with this character. And when you're writing, does that sort of play at the back of your mind that if I make this character too empowered, my reader might not like her or not want to identify with her? No, when I'm writing, I don't have an issue with who my characters are because I'm not trying to make everybody happy when I'm writing Mm -hmm. the book. But I feel sad that women don't think of themselves as empowered creatures in this Mm -hmm. world. And therefore, each book of mine has been about a woman who chooses empowerment. So, you know, whether it is through sexuality, whether it's, you know, leaving a marriage, staying in a marriage, choosing to have a child, not have a child, you know, LGBTQ issues that I have brought in. It's all about empowering yourself. So if a woman thinks that, okay, I don't identify with this character, then I feel sad because it's not about identifying. It's about knowing that you are empowered in whatever life that you have. You have a choice that you can make. And it's never to do with, you know, I don't have enough money. And when you choose yourself and self-care and self-love over everything else, 
which is what I want to bring about through my characters and my book and the ending of all my books. That's the message that I want to give out to all the women and even the men out there saying that you do have a choice with whatever that you choose, whether it's a bad job, bad marriage, bad relationships, bad city. If you can believe in yourself and do that, there you go. I mean, therefore, I have like a book called My Clingy Girlfriend. I was coming right to that. So <laughs> it's about, it's from a male perspective, perspective, right? And he's in this really horrific relationship. But he feels that because the woman is empowered and, you know, he is a man, he should do whatever that he can to believe in this love and believe in this marriage and or not marriage, but like this relationship. So until he realizes that, you know, maybe this isn't good enough. And some women are strange. You know, not all women are great, right? So I wanted to write that as well, that, you know, they are empowered women, mm -hmm. but they should be empowered men too. And what I find very fascinating is the fact that you wrote a male protagonist. <laughs> and I have always maintained that it is rightly competence to be able to write either gender from the perspective. What did you have to study, learn, observe? How did you write a male protagonist? Because all your fe protagonists have been female primarily till now. I think for many months, I just lived the male life. Like, you know, kind of a thing. I went to boys night and I, I met boys. I asked all my male friends to forward their boy jokes to me. <laughs> you know, like then I started looking at women from the male perspective as well, you know, because there were so many women around me who were nagging their husbands and they were nagging their boyfriends <laughs> and all. And oh so I was like, okay, I get it from the man's perspective. Why can't she just like keep quiet? Why can't she just, you know, allow me to do what I feel like doing? And then I understood what love is and love is very different for different people. Mm -hmm. So if I say that I want love for me is say somebody getting up in the morning and making me a cup of tea. Right. And for the man, it is like, OK, I've got groceries back at home at night, but he's not made tea in the morning. Mm -hmm. So there's two different ideas of love mm -hmm. and that dissociation that is there between these two people is what causes conflict. Right. So and mi misunderstandings. So I wanted to bring that out as well from the male perspective and saying mm -hmm. that, listen, this is a man who does so much. Right. Mm -hmm. And like most men do a lot. They are not like sitting and saying that, hey, you do everything for me and this is what love is. So how does the man feel empowered? So I've always wanted to discuss empowerment in my books. And what are the choices that you have for this? Speak about your television career as a, in the corporate world. You oversaw 300 episodes of Southern India. Right. And you worked with a multiple, a spread of producers and directors. And, right. But uh, creating something for television is a completely different ball game from writing. Writing is a very yes. solitary occupation. And plus, then all you need is your computer and your fingers and your brain. But this has money involved. And this has egos involved and this has people involved and a whole lot of other circumstances. What would you say are the primary differences in the creative process for both? Oh, it's very different. I remember once, like I thought I was this really cool executive producer, like meeting this, you know, producer for one of the episodes of Savdhan India. And I wanted to give him feedback on his script. Right. So we met at Starbucks, you know, where most producers sit. And then, you know, I said, you know, this script is not exactly how we would like it to go. We would like a little more crime in this. And, you know, these are I think your characters can develop a little more. And and I felt I had like this, you know, bit of an ego when I was sitting there because I've written seven books or eight books by then. And. I felt I have been learning through so many courses uh, about characterization and structure and all of those things. And here's a producer who is 55 years old. He's done television for 20 years. And he turned around and said, who the hell are you to tell me what to do? And he Ouch. got up Ouch. and he left Starbucks. Ouch. So, you know, I think the television journey made me realize that as a writer, I know nothing. Uh -huh. Okay. 
So I have to suppress everything that I have learned to be able to take like their feedback mm -hmm. and then get on their page, the producer's page, and then give them feedback. I can't walk in there in any situation and say, hey, just because I'm a producer, like just because I'm working with star, you know, I am a star. I'm nobody. Okay. And that was corporate life. And I think that that made me realize that anybody who's going into a corporate life, no matter how much you have done in your life and how many accolades and what marks you've got in your 12th grade <laughs> and whatever that you have done, when you go into a television world, you're nobody. So you have to be humble and, you know, allow some things to go rather than wanting everything to be perfect. And that's the creative process. There was a lot of unlearning that you had to do. A lot of unlearning. And ultimately, I had a fantastic team for Savdhan India. Baljeet and Preeti and a whole bunch of like people who really helped me uh, in STAR. And you know, I'm grateful to Gaurav Banerjee for giving me the opportunity as well to lead Savdhan India. I think it's always going to be a part of my life. Did you never think about writing crime, g given that you did Savdhan India for so long? I wrote Hate Story too. Hate Story, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I wrote that in film. Uh -huh. and um, In the book? And, and I don't know. I think maybe my next book might have crime in it. Okay. So let's see where it goes with that. Tell me about your creative process, Madhuri. How do you decide that this is the idea that I'm going to work on? Because, you know, ideas are like rabbits. They're all about the place. And they come to us all the time. And to f narrow down on one and say, this is the one I'm going to work on, I'm going to develop, I'm going to invest time in. How does that happen for you? I honestly don't believe that there are so many ideas that come to us. Because, I mean, there are thoughts that come to us. Mm -hmm. But they aren't ideas. Okay. So when the thought comes and the thought remains with you for a long period of time, then it becomes an idea. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can have a one-liner that comes to your head any point of time when you're reading the paper or you're traveling or you're seeing a strange person wearing a different color hat. So these can be very creative in your head and say, oh, I can use this as a person, as a character, whatever like that. But if it's a thought that remains and then that thought develops because you've gone for a walk or you have started speaking to somebody or you're sitting alone in a cafe or you're folding your clothes and putting them in your cupboard and the thought remains and it builds and it builds. Then you write that down and that becomes an idea. And then that idea you try and make into a synopsis and say, okay, what could be the end of this idea? And then when you have, say, an end, then you say, okay, what could be the conflict of this idea? And when you have the conflict and you say, okay, who could be this mean character and you make this character as flawed as possible with as many many issues that you can put into this character and then you work on it that's the creative process and there you have it that's a master class in writing a book <laughs> in five seconds a, from Madhuri Bhaj. master class <laughs> but I think that's how I kind of do it in a little and it takes a long period of time to do that so, are you a plotter or a panster? I don't think I'm either of those. I just write whatever comes into my head on a piece of paper. And then I try and put them together <laughs> whenever I have time. But uh, I feel like I work on characterizations more. Mm -hmm. I think when you have interesting characters that people can identify with and can relate. And you have a world which is interesting for them. Then you build on that. So, and then the plotting comes. Is there something you want to explore that you haven't yet explored in your writing? You've done romance, you've done chiclet, you've done life switch, you've done writing from a male perspective. I think I want to do fantasy. Fantasy, high fantasy or? Like high fantasy, like Lord of the Rings, Rings. Harry Potter kind of fantasy that I oh, haven't wow. been able to do yet because I haven't develop that world which is more important in a fantasy than you know other novels so I really want to be able to do that with flying horses and dragons and you know and things that are more powerful than you and and magic realism so I haven't been able to 
write that yet but i think i have a few ideas i don't know where it's going to go because as authors and writers we are labeled we are put in boxes by publishers and by readers and audience and it becomes very difficult then to you know break out and do something different and be acknowledged for it or appreciated for it which also brings me to the label that i think was quite unfairly given you got slotted as erotica someone who writes erotica right. when i feel very honestly that your books have social commentary more than erotica I there are so too, too kiran yeah <laughs> There is so there too. is some erotica, but that's okay. That's like love making happens. That's life. Big deal, you know. But I I made my love making very exotic. Like it was in a public place or like a balloon. <laughs> you know, I made it like I made the regular you know plotting of the book normal, and then I made the love making scenes like exotic, and hence like everybody was like, oh wow, you're an erotica writer. but i don't think so <laughs> did that ever bother you when you have to now as you say break out of these labels and these boxes we are always in labels mm. as women we are always in labels we're too fat we're too thin we're too dark we're too short tall fat i don't know with so many labels that we have we're just a housewife we're not a housewife we're a aggressive corporate women i mean adjectives are constantly given to us labels adjectives boxes so we always one more to, label to so it's we just have to break out of it or ignore it What's your writing day like? So I work out in the morning, and then I come back, and then I write for about two hours before lunch, mm -hmm. and then I have lunch. I'll watch some television. I'll take a nap, and then because you know sleeping in the afternoon is very important to me. Okay. Thank you for saying that. Very important. Like I don't want to like have a job where I have to work through the afternoon. you know because this nap is very important and even if it's a half an hour nap and then i'll get up and i'll write for about two more hours i'll go for a walk where i let my ideas just kind of stew for a bit see the sunset and then i will come back bathe dinner chat with family and then at night i'll probably work for another hour or so it depends it can go on for a little bit longer at night because it's quieter and there's less hassle of the home culture of maids and all of those things that are there so that's my writing process so the walk is important and i know that a lot of writers are creative people sort of swear by the walk the aimless walk that you have it's not a structured walk and it's not health purposes primarily it's just to soak in the surroundings so is it like a ritual with you you have to get the walk done to get your brain unclogged or some way. so julia cameron has also said that walking without purpose helps the creativity more than walking on a treadmill hmm. right so i feel like if you can go for a walk in the evening and not think of it as like steps or calories that you're burning or you know all of that things that you need to have you know or go shopping while you're walking but just you know put an alarm on your phone say 30 minutes of walking wherever you have to walk it does help you i mean forget like for the sake of creativity whenever you do anything for the sake of creativity you will not be creative <laughs> i can guarantee that okay <laughs> the minute that you say i'm going to put creativity on a shelf let it remain there i'm going to live my life without creativity you know you are flooded with creativity the creativity is so like that crush so you have to crush. make a conscious decision to not be creative hmm it sounds tough madhuri yeah <laughs> you have to put it on a shelf and go for a walk you have to put it on a shelf and then sit on your laptop oh. and then you have to put your creativity on a shelf and say i'm nothing and nobody i am not a creative person and then write and then paint and then speak you know but as a creative person you are often reminded by the world that you are nothing so you know for us to keep reminding ourselves that we are nothing is doubly painful <laughs> i think i have enough self love and self care to know that even if the world says i am nothing and nobody and i haven't achieved enough and i haven't sold enough copies and i have no money and you know all of that i know that i am good enough 
so i know these are the things that i need to do for myself and my creativity others can figure out what they need to do for it as well <laughs> <laughs> who am i to give gyan <laughs> no gyan is always welcome you're a country that loves to give gyan yeah yeah i know everybody has enough to give yeah. we don't we're not a country that listens which uh, brings me to that dreaded topic writer's block do you experience it any time how do you deal with it how do you cope with it how all the get... time every yeah. day daily years and years of like create like writer's block but i think it's called a creative block hmm. right so hmm. more than because everybody goes everybody through it. it everybody goes through it that's true. right so it's not just writers so it's a block that everybody goes through but i think the block comes because you put pressure on yourself and your passion mm-hmm. when you say that okay this is my passion and then you say okay now let's work on this passion and bring it structure and you bring your ego into the passion and then you say okay let's monetize this passion it will be blocked it's you know we are all fragmented selves so that fragmented self when you put that much pressure like if you're telling a 5 year old 5 baje uthke you have to start working the 5 year old will be like i don't want to work at 5 o'clock in the morning i you wouldn't know? want to work okay. at 5 o'clock in yeah. the morning oh, at 50 yeah forget the 5 year old <laughs> so the same thing so our creative aspects of ourselves are the most vulnerable and the youngest aspects of ourselves because creativity has come to us when we were really young small we were 2 years old when we were like being creative right so our creative selves are still 2 years old and now you're trying to like make this 2 year old person you know this huge star and this and that and whatever and you're putting that much pressure on it it will throw a fit and sit in a corner and give you a block so the minute that you say chal whatever you want to do do you know leave, leave it you know go wild you know then you'll go wild then you'll never have a block how do you pamper that 2 year old I take naps in the afternoon. I go for massages. Um I go for walks. I travel. I do a lot of self-care for that person as well as I read lots and lots of books. Okay? And I don't pressurize that 2-year-old to do anything that they don't want to do at any given point of time. I can sit in front of a piece of paper and take a pen and say it doesn't matter if you just want to doodle. I don't need you to write a synopsis. So some days I don't write the synopsis, but some days the whole synopsis comes. What do you feed that to your old in terms of inspiration? Authors that you read. I know you love art and art is an important part art of your life. Yes. So I go for art fests. I travel to different cities and I go for art fests. I I go to galleries. I mean anything which is, you know, creative, I go I go to bookstores a lot and I browse a lot of books all the time. So, you know, just seeing the blurbs of books, you know, just going to beautiful uh, galleries where you see lovely clothes, fashion, all of that. It's important to be surrounded by beauty in some way. Always. You have to have an artist date with yourself. So, take a day off and from your normal life and go do something that is going to pamper that artist <laughs> <laughs> as a writer i know that we are all very introverted i am I'm, you are most of us are we write writing is very solitary but then when the book is out there is this entire thing about marketing the book and promoting the book and being out there and being seen how do you handle this dissonance you're right i am an introvert and you know and uh, I don't know whether I do well in large crowds but I like meeting people and I like talking to them. I've never been really great at marketing and promoting my books probably but that has become super important now for all writers and all creative people. They have to have some sort of presence on online media. They have to be able to invest enough in their marketing and promoting with different agencies as well. and also i feel like every work whether it's i mean creative work book or otherwise has its own destiny mm, right so that's right 
no matter how much somebody will promote it and go on and on about it it can only be that much it'll go on for a month or two and then it'll die down you know and you have to work on something else in any case but to have a social media presence and to you know have enough friends who can talk about it helps in your latest book life switch right you've written about two very different kind of people right one is a homemaker by choice i wouldn't say by choice by circumstance right and one is a very very hard nosed corporate woman and they are like complete antipodes of each other how did you come up with these two characters and how did you research them how much i was ki- them you was them. <laughs> you were both i don't think them. it's a correct english but yeah <laughs> i was both of them you know <laughs> so at one point i was this housewife who was married and you know and waiting for the husband to come home and do something and i didn't have a job you know i was bored half the time you know i just really just wanted the love of my husband but my husband was distracted you know all the time so i think it's most marriages also because now there's netflix so you know we everybody <laughs> comes back home and everybody watches netflix you know what are they doing anyway so netflix and, and chill is really, really chill. they've taken it to, to another, another level yeah and i was this corporate person right so all the things that you read in life switch about annie and this corporate life i've gone through and uh, it's as lonely as being a housewife so while annie and nandita in this book were supposed to be completely opposites there were so many things that were in common that i've not really written about but it comes through with their choices that they have mm. so annie uh, this corporate woman she's single right so she's been dumped by her boyfriend so and nandita is in a marriage but she's lonely because she's not found the love of her husband as yet so and they both do this to prove something to themselves you know and that's what women do most of the time they want to prove something to somebody or to themselves that you know they're good enough or something will happen more in their life and they do this life switch and you know and then when a housewife goes into a completely corporate setup which i did because of sitting at home for 8 years looking after my child i went into star india and mm-hmm. then i went into viacom you know as vice president of content and I had to manage teams and be with people and then they were you know they were ruthless people and they were diplomatic people and there was like <laughs> a good boss and a bad boss you know so all yeah, of that a lot of yeah. gender politics at play which yeah. also comes in, out in the book all of it ha- was there so most of the characters and what they i mean these people um i've gone through so and then then i said let's just figure out what they have to do and so it's a book about love actually and the things that we do for love right so what does nandita as a housewife do for love from her husband and what does ani do for the love from her boss as well so that's a thing that's a, yeah the search for love it is <laughs> lovely all the very best for the book thank you and so much and may it reach every shelf of a reader who loves reading yes hopefully <laughs> thank you so much for taking time out for this madhuri thank you kiran and we look forward to reading more from you more books fantasy the thai fantasy you're talking about yeah let's i'm going so. to hold <laughs> you to that uh, i'll need tips from you kiran uh, hello <laughs> that's another conversation for another time <laughs> And with that it's a wrap on this episode of Chasing Creativity. We were chatting with Madhuri Banachi and do pick up a latest book Life Switch and you can follow me on Kiran Mandral on all the social media platforms. You can listen to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, on Binge Pods, on Spotify and wherever you get your podcasts from. Thank you and bye-bye. Okay.